And good morning and happy Labor Day weekend. Hey, how many of you were here last week with Michael Jr.? Is that okay? There was altogether too much laughing going on in church last week, so I want you to stop it right now. No. That was fun, wasn't it? Man. We had uh, hundreds of people respond to his call, either to faith or recommitment. It was just great. And by the way, as you look around the stage, I already told you a little bit about this. Just know that there's, uh, we need you to be like Gumby, real flexible for the next few weeks, right? Because this week, Lord willing, we're going to get some new screens, some monster amazing screens and signage is coming in, chairs should arrive here in the next couple of days. So uh, you might as well enjoy that chair that one last time, sink into it, you know, because it's going away. We're getting some new ones. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of physical changes. So if you have a heart, then Gumby's a part of you, okay? Just be flexible and stretch. And if you don't know what Gumby means, it's because you're too young. Ask your neighbor. And so we're starting a brand new series of messages called Forward to Freedom. One day, before a large group of people, and they were not all sympathetic to Jesus. There are people all over the map spiritually. Jesus looked at the crowd in the eyes and he said, if you hold to my teaching, then you really are my disciple. And you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Can you say those words with me? The truth will set you free. Lies don't set anybody free. A few verses later in John chapter 8 verse 36 Jesus says and if the Son sets you free you're free indeed freedom he was talking about freedom now the Jewish people weren't enjoying political freedom at that time they were under the fist of Rome there was some enslavement that went along with that as well Jesus was talking about spiritual freedom the most profound aspect of freedom what does spiritual freedom mean and I would go one step further and maybe just be a little bold in saying this. I've been a Christian now coming up on 40 years. Why are so few Christ followers enjoying the freedom Jesus came to give us freely? Because God has a lot of kids that aren't enjoying this freedom the way Jesus designed it in my best read of the text. So we're going to do this series called Forward to Freedom. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be digging into issues of identity and personal worth. And I want to start by reading to you uh, something that comes out of the book, Glad to Be Me. Don't be fooled by me. Don't be fooled by the face I wear because I wear a mask. I wear a thousand masks. Masks that I'm afraid to take off and none of them are really me. Pretending is an art that is second nature to me, but don't be fooled for my sake. Don't be fooled. I, I give the impression that I'm secure, that it's all sunny and unruffled within me as well as without, that confidence is my name and coolness my game, that the water is calm and I'm in command and that I need no one. But don't believe me, please. My surface may seem smooth, but my surface is my mask, my ever-varying and ever-concealing mask. Beneath lies smugness, no smugness, no complacence. Beneath dwells the real me in confusion and in fear and in aloneness. But I hide that. I don't want anybody to know it. I panic at the thought of my weakness and fear being exposed. That's why I frantically create a mask to hide behind a nonchalant, sophisticated facade to help me pretend to shield me from the glance that knows. But such a knowing glance is precisely my salvation, my, my only salvation, and I know it. That is, if that glance is followed by acceptance, if it's followed by love. It's the only thing that can liberate me from myself, from my self-built prison wall, from the barriers I so painstakingly erect. It's the only thing will, that can assure me of what I cannot assure myself of, that I'm really something, that I'm somebody. Who am I, you may wonder. I'm someone you know very well. I'm every man that you meet. I'm every woman that you meet. I'm every child that you meet. And right now I'm right in front of you, so please love me. I was, uh, this was several years ago, I used to go to Romania and teach in a Bible institute, really, really sharp kids, the students, I call them kids, they were younger than me, but 
it was fun because in Romania the students actually write down everything the teacher says so I thought maybe I was saying something important but I remember one day I was talking about the love of the father and about their identity as children of God and they were writing down everything that was coming out of my mouth and absolutely nothing was getting into their heart I could tell it I could look tell it by their faces they were getting it here and nothing was going 18 inches further down and it was one of those moments of clarity where the Holy Spirit said stop just stop and change directions Tell them a story. So I told them, hey, everybody, pens down. I want you to look at me. So all of these Romanian students looked up at me and I said, uh, our first child, Ryan, I'm gonna tell you the story of when he walked for the first time. Uh, it was pretty exciting. He'd taken a step or two and mom and I, Michelle's here in the service with us now, we were getting ready to let him walk and of course he's going to want to walk towards dad. So Michelle holds little Ryan and his arms are flapping. and he can almost fly to me, you know. He's wearing, you know, diapers so it's kind of the cowboy approach to walking, right? You know, right? Something like that. At any rate, Michelle's holding him and he's giggling so hard he's almost falling down because he wants to walk towards dad. And so I pull back about five or six steps and Ryan, Michelle says, okay, let go, are you ready? <laughs> so, let go, and so he takes that first step, and you know when they're first running, it's a wobbly affair, right? So he takes one step, and he's still standing, and he takes two steps, and he takes three steps, he's about halfway there, and he takes his fourth step, and in between four and five, he falls down. So I took off my belt, and I beat him. My audience in Romania didn't laugh. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because the Ceausescu years were hard in Romania. Forty years of communist dicta dictatorial ruling. And sometimes the dads, to kind of numb the pain, would drink cheap Russian vodka. And when they drank, they became violent towards their kids. Not all of them. Enough of them that a lot of the young people before me, they didn't know anything about the love of the Father. So I could tell that they're, me trying to tell them that their Heavenly Father, who they could not see, was loving and gentle, when all that they could see from their earthly father said the complete opposite was getting in the way. Because of a number of factors beyond our control, People, by the way, I did not beat my son, just FYI, I did not. He was walking in the right direction, come on. But because of a number of factors beyond our control, people do not feel inherently good about themselves today. There's a lot of negativity that comes our way as we're trying to figure out who we are and what our worth is. And it's a hard, it's a hard wrestling match. Besides just the general educational thing about evolution that tries to convince us at school and in the media that we're some cosmic accident that, that billions of years ago climbed out of some primordial scum pond, you know? It's just, it's just fallacy that, that robs us of dignity. There's also the fact that our culture continuously sends us messages about negativity, about who we are as we're trying to figure it out. And it hurts. They did this, this research project to, to find out how much negativity and positivity kids were getting. And so they go into the home, and you know, they found that for every positive thing that a kid, every positive comment, way to go, I knew you could do it, you're great, you're going to succeed. For every one positive comment kids got at home, they got 10 negative comments. Average family, you big loser, you're never going to make it, we knew it, you're never going to amount to anything. One positive to 10 negative. So we send them to school, it's better there, right? A little better. This research project found that for every one positive comment the kids got at school, they got seven negative comments. Now folks, you pile that up year after year, month after month, week after week, you got a lot of negativity on kids. And the study went on to say that to cancel the effect of one negative statement, we need four positive statements. Are you with me here? This isn't going in our favor. Let me, let me talk to the ladies for just a second. Guys, don't pay attention to me. Ladies, let's imagine you go to the dress store and you take a bunch of friends with you and you try on a dress. And four of your friends say, oh, it's darling, it looks like you, it's your color, it's perfect. And, but the fifth friend says, whoa, it makes you really look... Mm -hmm. 
You gonna buy it? No. What? Yeah, that's exactly right. No. It's an emotional outburst over here. I knew it. Well, let me become even more invasive with you this morning. Let's imagine here on stage next to me is a 17-year-old young lady. And I'm not joking, but she's got a body that's kind of shaped like a potato. And stringy hair and problems with acne. And she stumbles a bit when she walks. And she stutters a little when she talks. Gets average grades on a good day. In America, is there any hope for her? in a culture that's so appearance-driven, particularly for females. Is there any hope for her to develop positive self-worth and to actually think that she's important? In our culture, it's gonna be a fight. But what about before God? I mean, let's get real, church. Let's get real. Of course, this person can have a great identity because it doesn't come from appearance. But we're going to get to that because you've got to fight a lot of negativity if you're going to find your way to the end of this story about what we're really worth and who we are. What, what if uh, through some turn of events you and I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time together this week and I had a chance to really get to know you and you had a chance to get to know me. Do you think I'd like you? See, I do. I think I'd like you, but I think that somewhere in the back, we think if people get to know us, they won't like us because they'll find out. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And it's part of those broken records of that negativity that follows us. Like this pastor friend of mine got this letter from someone that attended his church. It was an African-American guy. And he said, Pastor, I need some help. You've got to tell me something because, Pastor, when I was born, I was black. And when I grew up, I was black. And when I get sick, I'm black. And when I lay in the sun, I'm still black. And when I die, I'll be black. But you, Pastor, when you were born, you were pink. And when you grow older, you're white. And when you get sick, you look a little green. When you lie in the sun, you turn red. When you're cold, you're a little blue. And when you die, you'll probably be purple. Why do you call me a person of color? (laughs) Explain that to your neighbor, okay? You know, we laugh, but the truth is, you know, we're told not to judge a book by the cover, but what do we do, people? We judge books by covers, right? We're really focused on externals, and we miss the big, the big issues about identity and worth. I, I, listen, uh, who am I? I'm Scott Hansen. No, that's my name. Well, I'm Danish. That's not really me. That's my ancestry. I might act like a Viking from time to time. That's really not me, right? Well, who am I? I'm American. No, that's my country where I was born. Well, let's say I'm independent or green or Democrat or Republican. No, that's really my political preference. Well, let's say I'm a public speaker and a musician. Those are abilities I have, but it's really not who I am. You see what I'm saying? It's really, it it has more to do with appearance and performance, and it's not really, in essence, who I am. How many of you have ever met a person where you did judge them ahead of time and you were completely wrong when you got to know them? You judged them based on externals and you were told, how many of you have done that? Okay, how many, how many of you have trouble telling the truth? Okay, because I just, I think that's just a common experience we have. It happens. So the Bible tells us we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, the apostles, apostles say, don't, Focus on externals because that's not where you get the answers you need for these identity issues. You get them somewhere else. And yet that's what we do, right? So here I am. I'm six feet tall. I'm a little more than 180 pounds. And I'm... (laughs) You're in trouble over here. Okay, I'm a little more than a little over 180 pounds. But if I got into a car accident tomorrow and I lost my left arm, would I still be me? What about if I lost my right arm as well? Would I still be me? What if I lost a leg? Would I still be me? Here's a, what if I got a heart transplant? Would I still be me? Or a liver transplant? See, eventually you keep cutting, you're gonna get me, but it's just not, it's not that easy to answer the question, who are you? Who are you? And we get these dead-end approaches concerning identity that get us in trouble like, 
Well, I'm the sum total of what I look like and how people admire me. Really? Do you know the Bible says that charm is deceitful and beauty is fleeting? Even for people that are given a lot of natural beauty, it's flying away, people. It's not going to stay forever. Or your performance plus your accomplishments, that's your real identity, right? Well, what if you don't have a lot of accomplishments? Are you not worth anything? Or what about uh, status and recognition? That's your personal worth. I, I think we're in trouble when we move down this direction to try to figure out who we are and what we're worth. Because, first of all, we're starting with ourselves, and I'll get to that. But I just think these are dead-end approaches to trying to figure out the big question of who I am. There's a, I have a police officer friend uh, that, that's in Italy. His name is Damiano. And, and Damiano used to have, among the various tasks that he had, the unfortunate task of having to go collect the bodies of suicide victims. A lot of young kids, too. And one time there was a note left by one of the bodies where the young man said, Mom and Dad, you gave me everything I needed except the indispensable. Goodbye. Kid didn't know who he was. He didn't get the kind of acceptance and affirmation that he needed. He had all kinds of money and resources, but he didn't get what he needs. So who, who are you? Really? Who, who am I? And by the way, where do we find our true identity? Do we find it in our appearance? Again, I want to tell you guys, even for the people that are drop-dead Barbies and Kens or whatever, they're not going to be that way forever. Is that where you get your appearance or your value? Or what about from what you do? Well, what if you're unemployed or you retire? Then do you lose your identity or your abilities? What if you get your identity from being a guitar player and you lose a finger? Do you lose your identity? Uh, from your parents. Now, maybe your parents transmitted to you a wonderful sense of identity, but there's a lot of kids where that didn't happen, and there was way more negativity than positivity in their home. Or from your family. I'll tell you what, if I believe what my brothers told me I was when I was growing up, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I had three brothers, and I, most of what they said I couldn't even say in church, but you know what I mean. Or, or, or what about uh, from my friends at school? They're going to help me figure out who I am. Really? Or from the world. You, you know the Bible actually says in 1 John chapter 5 that the whole world lies under the influence of the enemy? That's like getting your, getting your self-esteem or value from the devil, man. Or from television. This is fascinating. So many people feel bad about themselves after watching television because television tells your car isn't good enough, your teeth aren't white enough, your clothes aren't sexy enough or whatever. A whole system of sell, tell, television and promotion is, is that you're inadequate, otherwise you won't buy their products or services. So if you're trying to find your identity from TV, good luck on that one. Because they're going to basically tell you subliminally, subliminally, your life sucks. So don't go there. Well, what about for myself? You, you just sort of figure it out by yourself. How's that working for you? Here's one that's a weird twist in culture. In the last 20 years, there's a lot of people that self-identify by their sexual pro proclivities and preferences. And I'm not going to try to get into all that issue to say, except to say this. We are more than sexual expression as human beings. Way more. Well, what about if we get our identity from the devil? And you think, no, I'd never do that. But I want you to look at this list very carefully because what I just put up on the screen, if you get your identity from any of those sources, you are getting it from the devil. Because you're not getting it from God. And God wants to tell you who you are. And he wants to give you an amazing off-the-charts identity if you'll just listen to what he has to say. King David goes outside one night, sees the stars up in the skies and says, God, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the, ma the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful? What you, that you even care about us? God, human beings that you... You have any care for us at all. But God does care. And God steps into this identity question and this human worth question and he has some amazing, amazing answers for us in our confusion. Uh, uh, you might think I'm a little jumping around here a little bit, but I, when, I was, when I was a missionary in Italy, I traveled around the whole Mediterranean base as a concert artist and, and as a Bible conference teacher. And on my days off, I would go to archeological sites. I just love to study the questions about the origins of man and culture 
And one of the most moving experiences, you probably think I'm gross when I tell you this, is when I'm there on an active archaeological dig. I'm not participating, I'm usually just watching. Uh, and they unearth the skeletal remains of people that lived hundreds, sometimes thousands of years ago. It's a very moving experience for me because I sit there and I look at those dry bones and I think, I wonder if they knew God. I wonder if they were happy. Do you ever ask yourself the question, what's going to happen when I die? Do I, do I, when I stop breathing, do I just go back to dust? Is it all over? Is it just game over? Or is there more to this? Because when you start a life and you build it and all, it just it keeps going and physical death doesn't stop. Did you ever ask yourself that question? You should ask yourself that question. It's an important question. And by the way, I have some really, really, really good news for you today. God has spoken very clearly into this mystery about our identity and our meaning and our worth. And it's in, it's in his Bible. It's this revelation that breathes beautiful purpose and dignity into everything we do in life. So as we push away from the dock on this journey towards spiritual freedom, it's critical from the get-go that we see ourselves as God sees us. And I'm just going to warn you that if we don't see ourselves as God sees us, we're going to probably suffer in the self-esteem category, and it might actually neutralize our life, what we ever attempt to do, how we live. So this is pretty critical. Now, let me just, let, let, me, let me put it this way, okay? Today, in our culture, when people look at a person's life like it was a house, most of the focus goes on what they do, or performance, right? Or appearance. But I'm telling you this morning, that's not how you go about finding answers to identity and self-worth questions. We are made by God, and so we start with God. If you want to find who you truly are and what your worth is, you don't start with yourself. You start with your maker. You start with his nature. You start with his attributes. You start with who he is. That's bed, rock, stuff you can build your life on. And then from that knowledge of God, you develop a new identity in Christ. And then after you build your life on God with an identity in Christ, comes behavior, what we say, what we do, how we live. Now our culture says it's just the opposite. Our culture says, no, 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 no. You do, and that determines who you are. You, who you are in identity is based on performance. But the Bible says it could never be that way. And so the Bible says, no, it's actually the opposite. It's your being, it's who you are that actually determines your doing. And so I want you to grasp this. I'm going to put it to you in principle form. Only one principle this morning or this afternoon or whatever time it is. It's not what you do that determines who you are, but rather who you are that determines what you do. And I want you to understand that. Whether you write those words in the blank or not, as you follow along in the sermon outline, I want you to grasp this concept today. It is not what you do that determines who you are, but rather who you are that determines what you do. In other words, it's not the fruits of performance that produce the roots of identity. It's the roots of identity that produce the fruit that comes from our lives. Being must proceed doing. It has to be that way. And so with that in mind, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Remember that song? Let's go back to the early, early chapters of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Because they offer us answers about who we are and what we're worth. And if you don't believe this, if you try to write this off as a myth, you're missing out on a gold bind of material. Because it's beautiful. So as we turn to the early chapters of the Bible, for those of you that brought your Bibles this morning, good idea. We're going to read in Genesis chapter 2. And at verse 6... Or verse 7, we read these words. Beautiful, beautiful picture here. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The man became a living being. Everybody say, living being. In other words, this guy that God just made is fully alive. Fully alive. And we're going to kind of investigate what that means. But let's just think. God is creating, first of all, he created everything out of nothing, right? He created the material world. And then he takes the matter or the material of the world and he sculpts it together into the first man. It's kind of blast. It's like a clay project, right? And he creates this first man. And then he, 
He breathes the breath of life into his nostrils and he becomes a living being. Well, you think, well, what does that mean? First of all, remember, God is spirit. God doesn't have a body. Jesus assumed a body in the incarnation. God is essentially spirit. John 4, 23, God is spirit. Anybody that worships God must worship him in spirit and truth. So if, he, if man is made in God's image, man is essentially spirit with a body. So you're not, you're not a, a, a human being having a temporary spiritual experience. You are by nature a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. It's different. And God breathes his life into this guy and he becomes a living being and then he gives Adam something the animals didn't have. He gives him independent conceptual thinking, a mind. He's not driven by instinct. He actually reasons and rations. He gives him also emotions. Now I know animals have some emotions, but the nuances of emotional expression in a human being are so far exceed anything in the animal kingdom. And he gives us a will. Again, animals are driven primarily by instinct, but people are given the free moral choice. It's different. And then we're given a body too, because we live in a physical world, and so God gives us this physical envelope, and he gives us senses like seeing and hearing and touch and taste and smell. And through these senses and this physical body, we interface with this physical three-dimensional world that we live in. It's an amazing design. That was God who did that. I love it. And then he gets to Adam, and he does two things that are very important for you to see. He does it with Eve as well. He first of all gives this first couple physical life, right? Now physical life in Greek is bios, from which we get the word biology, okay? Physical life. Now physical life is when our soul or our spirit is in union with our body. So if you take the soul out of the body, you lose your bios, you lose your physical life, right? Physical death occurs when the soul or the spirit, I think those are synonyms, when the soul or spirit are separated from the body. That's why at a funeral, you bury the body because the soul is separated from it so that person is physically dead. Now, bios is therefore physical life. How many of you this morning have physical life? Well, all of you, right? Unless you're dead, then why'd you come to church? Okay? But God gave Adam and Eve something else too. He gave them spiritual life as well, which is zoa in the Greek. Spiritual life is when uh, we have life in our spirit. It, it's, we have spiritual life when our soul or our spirit is in union with God. And so spiritual death occurs when human beings are separated through sin from God. That's why Jesus came, by the way, to offer us spiritual rebirth, to re-give us the Zoa we lost in the Garden of Eden. That's why when we trust Christ, we're in Christ. We can be born again, born from above. Because we lost that when the first couple sinned. You follow? Genesis chapter 1, beautiful picture. Verse 26 says this. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. He gave them life, and they had bios, and they had zoa. The only other human being that was born with bios and zoa is Jesus Christ. Nobody else in history. Because after the fall, we're only born with bios. We are born, according to the scriptures, spiritually dead, but physically alive. Now, what you say, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. Explain that to me. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Let me show you a picture here, okay? Here's a picture of us kind of, I, I don't know, but does that look like you? It kind of looks like you. Okay, there you go. Okay, so we are essentially spiritual, right? Because God is spirit and we're made in his image. But then he wraps around that spirit a mind, emotions, and a will, which is in his image because God has a mind, emotions, and a will, right? Remember, whatever God wills, he's got a will, right? And then he gives us this three-dimensional body because we're in a three-dimensional world, okay? And uh, Jesus actually took on a body when he came here, but... This is who we are. Now, think about this. In the midst of this, Adam and Eve's life was off the charts. Amazing. Their identity was amazing. Their self-worth was amazing. In the Garden of Eden, as, as God addressed them and spent time with them, let me see if I can get this, 
They felt this profound sense of significance because they knew exactly why they were alive. They knew their God. They had a purpose. They were supposed to take care of God's beautiful garden and they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply and make a bunch of little babies that had Bios and Zoa. That was their purpose and so it was amazing. They felt uh, incredibly important. And then they also had this safety and security because all their needs were met. They never had a day when one of their needs wasn't met. And they never felt a minute, a second, a nanosecond of feeling threatened. They never experienced fear or worry or, or uh, shame or guilt or anger. I mean, all the negative emotions. Just think of a time when that stuff didn't exist. And they felt profoundly safe and profoundly secure. And finally, they felt this profound sense of belonging. God would walk in the garden in the evening time with them. They belonged to God. Their souls were spiritually attached to God. They belonged to each other. Eve actually came from Adam's body. They came from the earth as well. They belonged to the earth, the animal kingdom that they were, had dominion over. This was, you talk about great identity, great purpose, and great self-worth. My goodness. That's off the charts. But that's not what we see today, is it? Something got messed up along the way. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what happens in Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to back up with what God gives as a test. In Genesis chapter 2, we read in verses 16 and 17, if you're there. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. And there were lots of trees, man. I wonder if there was a honey walnut tree. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. But... But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when you eat from it, you will certainly... Say it louder. You're going you're gonna to die, right? Now, the day you partake of that stuff... This is the test, Adam. Eve, notice they, the command was given to Adam, if you pay attention here. Eve may not have even been created at this point. Adam, everything, all of it, it's all provided for you. Just stay away from that one tree. Why did God do this? Because we're given free choice to love God back. Otherwise, we'd be robots. God had to give them this test so he could see if they loved him back. He, God risks when he enters into relationship with us. All right? And what happened? Well, we know exactly what happened. You go tell your kids, you can do anything you want but that, and what are they going to do? They're going to do that, right? Adam and Eve broke that one rule. They partook of the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know that because this world is nothing like the Garden of Eden right now, right? I mean, there's death all over the place. In a, in a church this size, I, I hear about people dying every week, folks. That wasn't part of the original order. So what happened was that Adam and Eve lost life. And someone will say, well, wait, 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 wait. I read my Bible, and it's clear. After Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they lived for several hundred years and had more children and so they didn't die, they lived. It's because you've defined life incorrectly. You're focusing on Bios. Because the moment that they sinned, they lost Zoa. They lost spiritual life. Sin, by nature, separates us in relationship from a holy God. God cannot mix with rebellion. And so Adam and Eve, true or false, they died that day. Yes, according to God's definition of life, they died that day. In his mercy, he let them live physically for several hundred years and have other children so that he could create salvation in the future. But they died. And we watch people all the time walking around saying, look at that living person. No, they're dead. The Bible says that you're dead in your transgressions and sins. It says you're dead. It's a pretty negative commentary but this is what happens. So they fall. And so we come back to our happy drawing here. And we realize that sin entered into the very core of mankind. Into our souls. Into our spirits. And it brought death. The wages of sin is death. And so death goes all the way to the center of our being. And we're told in Romans chapter 5, 12. Sin entered the world through one man. And death through sin. And in this way death came to all people. Because all sin. So do you think that affects our minds now? And how we think? Do you think it affects our emotions now, our, our will? Absolutely. Let's just talk a little bit about our mind first. We're told in Ephesians chapter 4 that it says, In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. 
Our minds, our rational thinking has gone haywire. Our minds no longer move towards God, they move away from God. Look at our educational system in America and tell me, is it rather pro-God or anti-God? So we're educating spiritual idiots today. Sorry to be so offensive in my talk, but folks, let me give you an illustration. There is this major disconnect between the Western world and the Bible. Every time you come up against the word knowledge in the Bible, it's relational. It's people in relationship with each other or God. Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 literally says in the Hebrew, Adam knew Eve and she conceived and gave birth to a son. That's relational. They were sexually intimate as husband and wife and they had a child together. Knowledge is always relational in the scripture, but the West, the Western world has said, no, 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 no. Knowledge is different now. I can go to school at a university for four years, study material, memorize facts, and say that I know something. And God says, that's not the way knowledge works. That's why God didn't just say, hey, believe this and you'll be saved. He said, I'm sending my son so that when you enter into relationship with my son, you come alive. Even our Western models of discipleship are warped because we think all you need to do is study doctrine and you're okay. No, to live, you must dive into Jesus. It's the only way. And so, uh, even Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 3, says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Knowledge is relational. Enter into a relationship with God, be born again, and live. Okay? But that was, that was no extra charge for that. Okay? That had to do with the mind. How about, the, how about emotions? Did, was there any negative effect that the curse brought on emotions? I want you to read these verses right after they sinned. Genesis chapter 3, pick it up at verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They had regular communion with God. Oh, cool. And so they ran to God and said, here we are. Man, it's good to see you. What does it say? It says, they hid from the Lord God. Well, why would you hide? Because you're ashamed. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden and and then God called the man and he said, where are you? And he knew where he was, but he just played hide and seek. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was... What? I was what? Do you know they never feared before the fall? What a horrible emotion to experience for the first time. I was afraid because I was naked. What do you mean naked? Ashamed. But who told you you're naked? So I hid. And he said, God, who said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? As if he didn't know, right? And Adam immediately said, God, listen, it's all my fault. Please don't blame Eve. I, it's all my responsibility as the head of this family. Now, verse 12, he says, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So you look at these opening verses right after the fall and you've got shame and you've got guilt and you've got anxiety and you've got fear and you've got blaming and you've got projection of sin onto other people. Look at how fast we moved into sin and how it damaged us emotionally. Chapter 4, anger that boils over into murder. Cain kills Abel. You've got some pretty nasty emotions developing in, in the heart of mankind because it's sin. All that stuff did not exist before the fall. And now it does. And what about the will? Do we have a problem with the will today? I mean, a will is a wonderful thing. God gives us choices. Before the fall, there was only one negative choice to avoid, right? Today, we're surrounded by negative choices. Sometimes we have to choose between lesser evils. Look at our presidential election, right? So, <laughs> sorry, that just snuck out as a sin. And so, knock it off. Okay. Uh, but I want you to think about this. You know, even today, as we... as, as it's so hard to consistently choose to do what's right when our will is tainted and when it's stained and when it's disobedient and it moves away from God. Teach a child to walk and they'll walk away from you, folks. This is bad news. This, well, did the fall affect your body? Take a picture of yourself every five years in the same pose in the mirror. Put it right up there in the mirror. See if there's any change over time. Guys, we are aging. And we are moving towards physical death. Sorry to break the news. But physical death has a 100% batting average. 
I was looking in the mirror the other day, and since I couldn't see, I put my glasses on. <laughs> and I started noticing that my beard and my mustache are sprinkled with white hair. And there's a little bit of wrinkles around my eyes. And I thought, that never happened before. That must be this church's fault. <laughs> it's happening to me too. I remember going out to my sidewalk the other day and my will and my mind and my emotions said, body, run around the block. And my body said, no, I'm going to Judy's Donuts. <laughs> I just, it's not working for me the way it used to work for me. So I just I thought I'd throw that in. That's not in my notes. My wife's going to yell at me later. But, it, but I'm, you know, jokes apart, you, you, you think about how messed up the human race is because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And in the end of chapter 3, Adam and Eve are actually kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They're kicked out of the immediate presence of God. You ever read that? That's not a myth, folks. They were actually cast out of the presence of God because of their willful sin. And as a result, ever since that time, we've been trying, trying to figure out who we are. I mean, you take the highest apex of the Bible of achievement and wealth, and it's Solomon, the smartest guy in the world, the richest guy in the world, the best dressed guy, and the most sexed guy in the world, everything, thousand wives, everything, right? And what does he do? He writes a book called Ecclesiastes. It says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. All is a chasing after the wind. He climbed every single ladder that leaned on every single wall, tried to follow, follow all the old equations for success and identity and worth, and he got to the top and found they were leaning against the wrong walls. You'd think we'd learn, right? Adam and Eve, they're kicked out of the garden. What do they feel? Because of this, we feel this sense of rejection. We're no longer in the immediate presence of God. We're scratching at the doors to get back in. But we can't because we're fallen and God's holy and perfect. Therefore, there's this need to belong. That's why you have gangs today. Because gangs at least offer kids that weren't parented correctly some sense of belonging to someone or something. That's why you have social media and Facebook. People are wanting to belong in some sense. Put themselves out there so other people will say that's cool. And they, but now social media is becoming so hateful and so ugly and dangerous too. Because of our fallen hearts. The very way that we try to get acceptance. Man, we just get smacked in the hand again. You know, th th just a side note. Do you know why people come to a church like Creekside Christian Church? They usually come, studies have shown, they usually come because of quality as well as uh, options, uh, uh, programming options. Uh, what I mean by that is usually the sermon's good. Usually the sermon's good. <laughs> usually the sermon's good and, and the music's good and there's a lot of options for kids and families and things like that, right? And the pastor's exceptionally handsome, stuff like that. But <laughs> that's not why people stay at a church. People stay at a church only if they can find meaningful relationships with other people. Otherwise, you'll get them, but you won't keep them. That's why we need each other. That's why we need life groups. That's why we've got to do one another community. Because even if we kind of resist that, you know in your heart of hearts you need other people. There's this sense of belonging that we lost because of the fall. There's this sense of guilt and this sense of shame. Therefore, we need a new self-worth. And since the garden, we've been trying to cover or hide our guilt and shame as well as find some sense of personal value and worth. And what we generally do is we fall back on appearance or accomplishments or status or money or stuff that just, just climbing the wrong ladders, right? And our self-worth, it, it, if it's based on performance, can I just say, get off the performance track. It's not going to lead you where you want to go. And there's also this sense that we just feel weak and helpless, cast out of the Garden of Eden. And so therefore... You know, we just, there's this powerlessness and we feel like losers and why can't I be that great athlete or have that unique talent or those gorgeous looks if I just performed a little better or had a higher social status or made more money or lived in a different neighborhood, I'd have true value. I'd be important. I'd be a somebody. Um, this, I'm going to talk about this in the weeks to come. I'm just going to kind of throw it out there for you to consider. That as I look at this material, it dawned on me that sin is really simply any attempt on our part to meet a legitimate need in the wrong way or an inappropriate way. Remember that old Willie Nelson song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places? 
Being loved is a legitimate need. The way you pursue it may be incredibly illegitimate. And see, we all have these needs, but if you don't trust God to meet these needs, you're going to go after them yourself, and generally you're going to go out of bounds when you do it. So it's not usually because people are just horrible, awful. It's just, we just have needs and we want them met. But back to the story, what we've discussed this morning really is the graphic illustration of bondage. They went in the Garden of Eden from paradise to prison, just like that. And we've been trying to get back into paradise ever since. But the story doesn't end here, guys. What if I were to tell you that there's an amazing solution to our identity and spiritual bondage problem? And that this bondage thing doesn't have to get the last word. What if I could show you from Scripture that Jesus Christ actually came to turn all of this around for us. He came to deal with our sin problem and to give us true life, Zoa, back to us through spiritual birth. So that we could have what they had in the Garden of Eden and even more today. Might you be interested to know that your God still loves you and has put in motion a plan that can give you back what was lost in the Garden of Eden. And in the process, through faith in Christ, you can discover a spiritual identity for yourself and self-worth that's out of this world because it doesn't come from you, it comes from God. You see, the Apostle Paul, he describes this graphically in Romans chapter 7 when he says, what I want to do, I can't do. What I don't want to do, I do. And then he says in verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? My mind, my will, my emotions, my soul, my body. They're all out of whack, God. But then he says, but thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. There is a solution. I'm going to cheat and tell you a little bit about next week, okay? There is a secret in the New Testament that unlocks the whole concept of your identity and self-worth. Just two words, one phrase, real simple. Repeated regularly in the New Testament, and for years I missed it. One secret that will help you unlock this whole issue of who you really are and what you're worth in the eyes of God. In Christ. In Christ. Listen to me. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And I'm telling you, it's all over the place in the New Testament. And you either believe it or you don't. So the big mystery in life today is, are you out of Christ? Or are you in Christ by faith? Because when you place yourself by faith in Christ... This whole new worth and identity issue explodes in your life and fills you with new... You know what it tells you? I'm not going to tell you. Come back next week, okay? <laughs> but we're going to go there next week, and we're going to talk about what God says is true about you. And I'm telling you, if you believe it, it will change you. Let's call our ushers forward, and let's, uh, let's receive our morning tithes and offerings. Call our worship team back. Let me pray, okay? It's really good news, folks. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I, I want to thank you for this church that has a, have a, has a very strong reverential attitude toward the Word of God and truth. And Jesus, we know you're here. You said wherever two or three are gathered in, in my name, I'm there. So we just want to say to you, Jesus, thank you for making freedom available to us. And we... We acknowledge through faith that it is only truth that will set us free. And the Son of God who will set us free. Jesus, I'm going to pray over the next eight weeks that you really heighten the degree of spiritual freedom we experience as we turn to the truth and release it by faith into our life. You are the center of all truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And so, Lord, we look for life and meaning and value and identity only in you because that's the only smart place to find it. So help us find it. Help us lean into it. Help us live into it big, we pray. Help us be free as we move forward toward freedom, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.